Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Future Human. I'm James P. Barbieri, Program Coordinator here at the Pari Center, and I will be your host for today. If you have any issues, please let me know in the chat and I'll try and help you out. Um, just very briefly, a quick reminder to ensure your microphone is muted. Uh, we do encourage you all to have your cameras on. Um, and of course, the chat will be open. Uh, so feel free to uh, share your thoughts with the rest of the group in the chat. Uh, finally, the session is recorded for archival purposes. Um, and in, uh, we should receive the link to the uh, YouTube recording uh, once it's all ready to go. Uh, so today we have the honor to be joined by uh, Graham Hancock who is the writer and presenter of the 2022 hit Netflix documentary TV series, Ancient Apocalypse, and the author of the major international nonfiction bestsellers, The Sign of the Seal, Fingerprints of the Gods, Magicians of the Gods, and American Before, and also the epic adventure novels, Entangled and War God. His public lectures, radio and TV appearances, including several major TV series, as well as his strong presence on the internet, have put his ideas before audiences of tens of millions. He has become a, recognized as an unconventional thinker who raises resonant questions about humanity's past and about our present predicament. In January 23, Hancock was voted number 23 in the Watkins list of the 100 most spiritually influential living people. Today, Graham will be in conversation with Alex Gomez Marin around the topic of humanity's ancient past. And with that, I'll hand it over to you two. Welcome. Thank you so much, James, as always. And thank you very much, Graham, for accepting our invitation to be My in pleasure. conversation. I'd like to start with a remark. A colleague of mine who's an archaeologist told me when I mentioned to him that I was going to be in conversation with you. And he said, and I quote, get as far away from him as possible. Mm. And so I wonder, it's rhetorically, because we're going to talk about it, I wonder what could be so dangerous about me talking to you in front of such an audience. Perhaps we can start with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a very curious uh, phenomenon. I, I've faced um, unpleasant personal attacks from archaeologists almost from the moment that I began to explore the possibility of a lost civilization, um, which I have explored in, in a series of books, some of which you, you mentioned. Um, but this um, hostility towards me and my work uh, increased to many fold uh, when my Netflix series, Ancient Apocalypse was released. And that's, that's simply because uh, it was reaching a very large uh, worldwide audience. Um, and uh, it made me realize that what archaeologists, or rather I should say the institution of archaeology is doing in its reaction to me is engaging in a kind of propaganda war. Uh, we are dealing with uh, an institution which seeks to control the narrative of the human past, to say that uh, the narrative of the human past is the correct and proper property of archaeologists, uh, and that it doesn't belong to anybody else. Sure, there's a place for amateurs, as long as the amateurs say the things that the archeologists themselves are saying, as long as what they're saying doesn't rock the boat. But the moment that somebody comes in from outside the field and starts saying things that contradict the mainstream archeological narrative, uh, this kind of propaganda war begins. And I, I often find that archaeologists make criticisms of me and make statements about my work when A, they have not actually read any of my books, uh, and B, they've probably not watched the TV series either. Mm. They have a preconceived notion about who I am and what I am and what I'm interested in, uh, and they try to slot me into that preconceived notion and attack their preconceived notion of me rather than necessarily the work that I do myself. So for example, uh, Ancient Apocalypse was accused by archeologists of uh, promoting racism and white supremacy. Uh, this is very difficult to understand since the subject of race is not discussed 
in ancient apocalypse at all. But in terms of a propaganda war, if you apply the label racist and white supremacist to somebody, and then you get that magnified in the media by journalists who pick up your words without actually investigating the matter. I've noticed a lot of lazy journalism in the coverage of ancient apocalypse. They simply accept what archeologists say without actually doing the work themselves. Uh, eventually enough noise is made uh, that the label begins to stick. And that's why I call it a propaganda war because the, the effort is not really to engage in direct uh, debate or discussion with what I'm proposing. The effort is to get rid of me by the, by the quickest and most easy manner possible, which is to apply obnoxious labels to me and to my work. And it doesn't matter whether they read my work or not. They're just going to apply those labels anyway because the project is not to take seriously or explore what I'm proposing. The project is simply to get rid of me. And it's in that context that the, the archeologist you spoke to told you to stay away from me. Mm -hmm. They would like the whole world to stay away from me. They don't want any uh, opposition to the narrative of human prehistory that mm -hmm. have been presented. And I think it's important to be clear, there is a difference between archeology span and history in this area. We have, a period roughly 6,000, going back roughly 6,000 years, where we have documents that can be read, uh, which tell us about what was going on. But when you go back before that, you don't have any documents. What you have is scarce objects that are dug up out of the ground, uh, often in a very random way, and conclusions are drawn from those excavations. And on the basis of those conclusions, archeologists claim to be the sole arbiters of the human past. They are the ones who are entitled to tell the human story. And anybody else who tries to tell a different version of the human story to present a different relative must, a, a different narrative must be attacked and, and uh, must be diminished in some way. This, this seems to have been the project. Fortunately, we live in an age where, where the general public are able to make up their own minds and have access to many sources of information. Uh, and certainly, the, although there's no doubt that the attacks on ancient apocalypse were intended to prevent viewers from watching it, to make viewers stay away from Hancock, uh, they are rather appear to have had the opposite effect uh, and to have rather backfired on the, on, on the archaeological establishment. So we have an institution that seeks to present itself as the sole arbiter of the human past. And I don't think that's healthy. Uh, and, and I have tried to provide an alternative, properly researched, properly reasoned uh, point of view on the past. And I think something is missing from the past. And I've tried to make that case over the last 30 years. Yes, indeed. And there's this irony that in the very efforts of deplatforming somebody, you in this case, while you have all these books that are bestsellers, while you appear on Joe Rogan, while you have this successful Netflix series, and including your TED Talk, which mm. was banned 10 years ago. Well, that seems to, in a way, defeat the purpose of the deplatforming. And as you're describing, it's strange to see how, well, I was reading some of the accusations, right? And well, pseudo-archaeologists, we'll talk about what the, this prefix does to people, right? Pseudo-archaeologists, well, we'll see. But then false claims, then even conspiracy theory. Yes. I've even read like an analogy with stochastic terrorism, like the idea that it's conspiratorial but stochastic, so it's even more dangerous because you don't know when or where it's coming from, and then one needs to raise the ante and call you racist, right? So See, for, let, let, me, let me pause you there on that issue of conspiracy theory. I'm accused of being a conspiracy theorist, but nobody states actually what the conspiracy mm. is. Mm. Um, they, again, it's one of those labels, which if you apply it to a person enough times and enough people repeat the label, then everybody says, oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. We'd better mm. stay away from him. But actually, archaeologists have never made it clear what conspiracy they think it mm. is I'm approaching. The closest they come to it is to say that Hancock believes that archaeologists are in a conspiracy to conceal the past from us. Hancock doesn't believe that. I don't believe there is an archaeological conspiracy to conceal the past from us. I think archaeology is functioning like a very large institution which has set rules and set ideas, a set paradigm about the past. And I think that paradigm is very confining on what archaeologists are able to see and imagine 
and consider about the past. So it's not a conspiracy. It's a natural, it's a natural byproduct of their view that they are masters of the past, mm -hmm. that they are the experts in the past, just as the way a pilot of an airplane is an expert in flying an airplane. So archaeologists say they are the experts on the past. And just as we would trust, we would not trust an unqualified pilot to fly our plane. So we shouldn't trust an unqualified individual like Hancock uh, to make any comments whatsoever on the past. But I think there's a huge difference between flying a plane and doing archaeology. Uh, an, an enormous difference. And that difference is to do with the very limited amount of inquiry that archaeologists have undertaken into our past. Now, mm -hmm. if you ask an archaeologist about this, they'll say they've taken, undertaken an enormous amount of inquiry. But let's unpack that a little bit. Let's go to countries where a lot of archaeology is done and where the funding is available, countries in the West, for example. Very often, archaeology is not the result of a targeted search. Very often what happens is that a road is being built or a dam is being built, uh, and this is going to disrupt the local environment. And it's thought healthy to bring in archeologists to see if there's anything there that is important that might be disrupted. So this is what drives most archeology span is a road or a dam is being built and we better see if there's anything there of archeological importance rather than a targeted uh, investigation. Secondly, uh, archaeologists have a tendency to dismiss evidence that doesn't uh, appeal to them. Uh, the Great Sphinx of Giza is officially attributed to around 2500 BC, 4500 years ago, and is thought by archaeologists to be the work of a pharaoh called Khafre of the fourth, of the fourth dynasty. Uh, but the geological evidence suggests very strongly that the Sphinx is much older than that that the Sphinx has been subjected. Professor Robert Schock at Boston University, professor of geology at Boston University, stuck his neck out. He's a leading figure in this field. And, and he was willing to take the risk and put his reputation on the line and say, when I look at that structure, I see evidence of exposure to a thousand years of heavy rainfall. And such rainfall did not fall in Egypt four and a half thousand years ago. It was as dry then as it is today. You have to go back 12,000 years to get the kind of rainfall that could have caused the weathering on the Sphinx. Well, the, the solution of Egyptology and archeology span is simply to ignore that and say, we know that the Sphinx was built during the time of Khafre, but actually they don't know that. Uh, there, is no, there is no compelling evidence that connects the Sphinx to Khafre. Some say that its head looks like the head of Khafre, ignoring the possibility that originally we had a monument that was totally a lion uh, and that the head of the lion was in much later time carved down into, the, into, into a human head. And this makes sense when we take account of the er erosional aspects of the Sphinx. So, so what I'm saying is that compelling evidence for an older structure uh, is simply ignored uh, by, by archeology span and they keep focusing on their, their main case, uh, which is that the Sphinx was built by Khafre. And in fact, the evidence for that is extremely flimsy. Yes, there's a stella between the paws of the Sphinx uh, erected more than a thousand years, even after the date that archeologists accept for the Sphinx, which once contained the single syllable calf in its 11th line. Uh, it didn't have a cartouche, a royal cartouche around it. Uh, and subsequently that syllable has eroded away from that stella. Uh, but the stella was erected by a Pharaoh who had conducted a restoration campaign on the Sphinx. And he could equally well have been saying that Khafre was a restorer of the Sphinx rather than the original creator of the Sphinx. All of these con concerns and considerations are just dismissed by archeology span and not regarded as important. I've made it my business to try to put them into the public arena and to get people to think about these things. And this makes archeologists extremely angry. Then mm. they say, oh, uh, we know that there was no lost civilization during the Ice Age. They state this categorically. Quite a number of my critics have said, we absolutely know that there was no lost civilization during the Ice Age. And we are supposed to just accept that on the authority of the archeologists themselves. Yet what do they know? As I mentioned, most archaeology is driven by road projects or large scale engineering projects, not by a targeted search. Secondly, there are large areas of the world, the Sahara Desert, the Amazon rainforest, the flooded continental shelves, 27 million square kilometers that are underwater today were above water at the end of the ice age. 
where very little archaeology has been done. I'm not saying no archaeology has been done, but very little has been done. Certainly not enough to completely rule out the possibility of a lost civilization. Archaeology should admit that it is a work in progress and that the next turn of the archaeologist's spade could change the picture entirely. And I'm, I've simply made it my role and my, my place to offer alternative evidence so that the general public out there have the opportunity to consider not just one case, the mainstream archaeological case, but to consider a properly argued and reasoned alternative case as well, and then, and then make up their own minds. Yes, and here we have, a, there's so much to unpack here. Here we have a triple challenge, at least, and challenge to put it mildly. We have alternative evidence, we have alternative narratives, and we have what you were describing, which is an amateur in the etymological sense of the word. It's a word I love. Mm. Amateur, some, somebody who's lovingly studying a subject who's prevented from commuting with the professionals, right? So all of these things is like a triple thread that, that runs together in, in, in the question that, that I would like to explore further with you today, which is given the future of human, which is the name of this series, we should look back and understand what happened as the question, but it's, it's a bit naive to only consider what happened. We also need to understand who says, who's entitled to say what yeah. happened. So, well, I, I suppose we'll be dancing between one and the other. So, well, just go wherever you want. What happened? Um, what do you think that happened, Graham? Well, the key, the key issue is the Ice Age. Uh, which in terms of evolutionary perspective is a very recent event, the last ice age, roughly 120,000 years ago down to about 11,000 years ago, when the world looked very different from how it looked today. The last glacial maximum was achieved around about 21,000 years ago. That's just yesterday in, in evolutionary terms. Anatomically modern humans had already been present on the planet for, for, for nearly 300,000 years by then. We have, we have skeletal remains of anatomically modern humans from Morocco, which are, which are close to 300,000 years old. Um, and, and yet what we're talking about is a climatic event that occurred very recently and that came to an end cataclysmically between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Uh, and we know it was cataclysmic. The, 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 the geological term for this epoch is the, is the younger dryas after a particular kind of alpine flower that flourishes in cold conditions. 12,800 years ago, the world had been warming up actually for quite a while in a rather gentle and polite way. And then anomalously, two things happened. There was a sudden sea level rise and global temperatures collapsed and became extremely cold. I say anomalously because as we enter a period of deep freeze, you would not expect sea level to rise. You would expect the water, the excess water to be frozen in ice caps, not to enter the ocean. But something occurred that caused a large rush of meltwater off those frozen ice caps into the world ocean, raised sea level 12,800 years ago, and simultaneously brought about a dramatic drop in temperatures. That episode, the Younger Dryas, saw the extinction of all the megafauna of the Ice Age, the, the saber-toothed tigers, the woolly rhinos, the mammoths, the mastodons, the, the giant sloths, all of, these, all of these iconic creatures of the Ice Age, they went extinct in that very brief window between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago. Some of them might have clung on for a few hundred more years, but basically it was a massive extinction event. And There's that's not, if I may interrupt, that's not controversial yet, no, isn't it? Not, no, it's not controversial. It's absolutely accepted. But what does this mean? It means that the world went through a trauma, uh, a, a trauma that led to the extinction of, of, of huge numbers of animal species. And the evidence is that also led to a bottleneck in human populations. That the, the, this was a cataclysmic event uh, by any standards, uh, and yet it isn't taken into account in the construction of the human story that archaeologists give to us. It's really not, not considered as important. In fact, cataclysms in general are not considered as important. Everybody accepts that cataclysms occur, but somehow they're not supposed to have played a role in the human story in the last 20,000 years. Well, I beg to differ. I think the Younger Dryas was a cataclysmic event. 
uh, and um, we cannot build the house of history solidly and soundly with this in its foundations unexamined and unexplored. Uh, so I've, I've tried to draw attention to this, to this cataclysmic epoch um, and, and to, draw, to draw attention to certain kinds of knowledge that were present in the world during the Ice Age and that have passed down in the form of myths and traditions around the world. Again, archeologists don't like myths and traditions very much. Mm. Uh, they're hard to weigh and measure and count. Um, they're considered to be fanciful and, and fictional in, me in many cases. But to me, it's fascinating that, that there are literally hundreds of myths from all around the world that speak of a global flood uh, and that speak of the destruction of a former civilization uh, during that cataclysm, whether we're talking about Kumari Kandam in Southern India uh, or whether we're talking about Plato's Atlantis, they're all saying essentially the same thing, that there was a former civilization, that uh, it was destroyed in a global cataclysm and that the cataclysm involved flooding. And very often, even the same date is given. The Kumari Kandam tradition is traced back to between 11 and 12,000 years ago, and so is the Atlantis tradition. And that matters because the Younger Dryas began 12,800 years ago with a cataclysm, but it ended 11,600 years ago with an even bigger cataclysm and an even larger sea level rise, Meltwater Pulse 1b. Uh, I just feel that all of this needs to be taken into account uh, if, we're, if we're truly to construct a, a, an edifice of the human past that actually has solid foundations. And this has not happened yet. I'll ask you later about not only the why, but the what for of this resistance to this narrative. What, what are we or are they or are some people gaining from refraining to entertain? But before that, tell us a bit more about this ancient civilization. Well, you know, because... if, I, if I could pause you for a moment, I don't mind resistance to the narrative. Resistance to the narrative is fine. It's just the very poor quality resistance that archaeology has put up, mm -hmm. where they haven't really bothered to engage with my arguments. They say Hancock presents no evidence. Well, I'm sorry, I've, I've, I've written a whole series of books on this on the last 30 mm. years, mm. books that are hundreds of pages long with thousands of footnotes. Yeah. I, yeah. Present, I present a great deal uh, of, 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 of evidence for this. No, well, thank you for pausing me here. We can continue this thread because this is something crucial, not only in archaeology, in biology, in physics, in neuroscience, what's considered sufficient evidence, right? Yeah. And no matter how much evidence you may provide, if that doesn't if that doesn't fit within one narrative, that's why we were emphasizing evidence and narratives. Yeah. Um, well, in kind of in a bias like fashion, right? The probability, the, the updating of the prior, it's not going to happen just because no matter how new evidence comes in, your your prior is is not gonna is not gonna update because you have zero belief in that an alternative can take place. Well, so Thomas, Thomas Kuhn wrote a fantastic book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Uh, and we know that we, 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 we know that knowledge does not advance in a slow and gradual fashion. Uh, a paradigm becomes fixed and firm and locked in place. And it takes an overwhelming amount of new evidence before that paradigm can be overthrown. Mm -hmm. And this is partly just human nature. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people have their careers invested in a particular view of the human past. Uh, they've devoted their whole lives to that. And here comes some amateur Hancock coming along saying, hang on, guys, you may have got something wrong. You may mm. be missing part of the human story. Yes. And that's just very annoying. And the natural reaction is a territorial defense reaction mm. to defend the territory of archaeology, yeah. to say, stay away from this guy. Don't listen to what he ha has to say. And, and then to accuse me of all sorts of things which I don't do. Another very peculiar thing is that archaeology very frequently when archaeologists criticize me, and it's proof that they don't read my books, uh, and haven't watched the series, is they associate me with the ancient alien hypothesis. I have no interest whatsoever in the mm. ancient alien hypothesis. I've never advocated that. I don't think that any structures on earth require aliens in order to explain them. But I do think they require a higher level of technology, of astronomical and engineering knowledge than archaeologists usually attribute to that, to that period. Mm. And to mm. my mind, a lost human civilization is a plausible hypothesis. And that's all I'm presenting. I'm yeah. presenting a, hy a, hy a hypothesis for consideration. And uh, I don't expect archaeologists to bow down and say Hancock is right, but mm -hmm. I don't expect them 
to attack me personally, to mm. use the techniques of propaganda, uh, to accuse me of all sorts of things that I don't do, of being an ancient alien enthusiast, of being a white supremacist, mm. uh, you know, to, 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 to use these ad hominem attacks yeah. on me in order to discredit my arguments, but not to get to grips with the arguments themselves and to create false flag uh, events where they, again and again, I've noticed this where an archeologist or their friends in the media will say, Hancock says this, mm -hmm. but actually Hancock doesn't say that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, but the, this is a propaganda war. That's, that's what it is. I, I hear and I listen um, in, the, in, the, in what you say and in the way in which you say it, of course, this anger, this frustration, this sadness, and it's on, it sounds what it is, very confrontational, right? I wish it, 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 shouldn't, it wouldn't be this way. It, it's like a trial, it's like the Holy Inquisition and trial by combat. I mean, isn't there, you may have tried all different ways, isn't there a way to just engage and try to engage and back and forth so that this is not even still manning you know that idea even you still manning the op the opposition and the opposition still manning you or it's all very much like this trial to death combat that that's so un uh, unscientific in a way because that yeah. that sounds more like war than actually trying to figure things out yeah, well, it is a war in a way, and, and that's why I've agreed to debate uh, Flint Dibble, who's a senior archaeologist, um, on the Joe Rogan experience in October this year. Many, many people, most of them with YouTube channels, have sought to debate me, uh, but I haven't seen the necessity to do so. I'd rather debate a proper archaeologist who's deeply invested in the archaeological institution, and that's what Dr. Flint Dibble is, and that's why I'm going to debate him. Mm -hmm. uh, I would much rather have a friendly, open-minded, easygoing discussion, but mm. I've been forced into this position where I have to fight back. Mm. For example, in Ancient Apocalypse, many archeologists claim to be offended that I criticize and attack archeology. span And I say that archeologists regard me, Graham Hancock, as public enemy number one. But what they have to understand is there's a background to this, that I have been subjected to these very, very unpleasant ad hominem attacks by archeologists using words like fraud, hoaxer, uh, white supremacist, or whatever, whatever, whatever can be used to pseudoscientist. I've been subjected to these kind of attacks for 30, 30 years. Uh, and I, I absolutely knew what was coming when I did Ancient Apocalypse. And it was important that the audience know this as well. Does it happen? Let me ask you differently. Do you have allies, 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 sorry. Do you have allies and do you have them within the, com the citadel of academia and without? I mean, can you talk to certain archaeologists and they say, yeah, Graham, I agree, but you see, um, I cannot make a professional living out of that. Do you have yeah. people around who, because yeah. otherwise it sounds like you're, you're alone fighting these dragons, right? Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not alone. Uh, for, first of all, I, I, I do have allies within the field of archaeology. Um, but they are part of institutional archaeology and what they can say in public differs from what they can say in private. Uh, nevertheless, there are archaeologists I've, I've worked with and I'm, I'm in contact with who've been very open and friendly towards me and I try to, to recognize that. When I first went to Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, uh, Klaus Schmidt, uh, sadly he passed away in 2014, I met him in 2013, uh, was the head of the excavation at Gobekli Tepe. He was very, fr he knew who I was. He didn't drive me away from the site. He didn't ban me from the site. He spent three days showing me around the site and sharing his point of view with me. I wish it could be more like that. I wish, for example, that I could return to Egypt and continue my studies and my work there. But the Egyptian government, on the advice of Egyptologists, have banned me from visiting Egypt. I'm not able to visit Egypt. Uh, what a clever way to to prevent a critic from doing their work is just deny them access to sites mm. that are an important part of their work. Since I got banned from ancient Egypt, I feel like I've had my left arm cut off. Um, and this is, this is not the proper way to be. What are they afraid of? What are they, what are they so afraid of that they have to, to ban me from sites? Why did I get banned from Serpent Mound? Why weren't we allowed to film in Serpent Mound in, in Ohio? Uh, during the film, filming of Ancient Apocalypse. Again, it's because my point of view differs from the point of view of mm. archaeologists. And rather than engage in a discussion, they simply find it easier to get people to stay away from me and to get me to stay away from their sites. 
And if you ask them about it, they'll say this is perfectly justified. And if you ask them why it's justified, they'll say, well, it's well known that Hancock is a fraud and a hoaxer and a white supremacist. But all these are labels that archaeology has made up. Mm. They're ad hominem attacks. They're not engagement with the substance of my work. Now, let me come back to the what for I was alluding before. So they may defend their views for, for whatever reasons, maybe really trivial, even dull reasons, because that's what they've been doing and it's hard to change. But how would our understanding of humans today and the future human change if we adopt your, your take on ancient apocalypse? Well, what changes? What are the consequences? I think the, I think the key consequence is um, the, mis, the misapplication of evolutionary theory to social development. Um, there's a tendency, and it's very much reinforced by archaeology, to see our civilization today as the apex and the pinnacle of human achievement. Uh, that the whole human story has been about producing this incredibly advanced, sophisticated, technological civilization uh, that uh, controls much of the world in the 21st century. Um, the perspective I'm trying to propose that we've missed a whole episode of the human story, that there may have been an episode of what we would recognize as an advanced civilization, not identical to our own, but with advanced and sophisticated knowledge that requires centuries to, to, to build up, that there, that there may have been such a civilization uh, dur during the Ice Age. Um, this, this then removes from us our place on the pinnacle of human achievement. We're just part of a story that with ups and downs, that civilizations can exist and can be completely destroyed. I mean, archaeologists know this. The Indus Valley civilization was unknown until the 1920s when it was accidentally discovered while a railway was being built. To this day, we cannot read the script of the Indus Valley civilization, even though they had, a, they had a script. So civilizations do get lost. And the argument that a civilization may have got lost, that we've forgotten an important episode in the human story during that cataclysmic event at the end of the Ice Age is one that I think deserves to be given more attention by archeologists than it has been. Not because I'm saying it, but because those are the facts. We have a global cataclysm and that global cataclysm occurs at the very origins at the very moment when archaeologists think that civilization starts to begin. Uh, I prefer to see it as a as a restart or a reboot of civilization. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what, would, what, would the, what would the consequences be? A less arrogant uh, mm -hmm. future human, mm -hmm. uh, future humans who, who regard the past with a more open mind, who don't, who don't regard the path that we have taken as the only le legitimate path, that there are other ways that civilizations can evolve and develop. Uh, I, th I think it would, uh, it would help us to control our hubris, uh, to make us less confident in ourselves. And that's a good thing because our overconfidence in ourselves is one of the reasons that we're making such a mess of the world today. And the concrete reminder that we can go extinct as a species, right? That's also... We can go extinct as a species at any time, and any civilization can be lost. I mean, we imagine that our civilization is very strong uh, mm. and, and completely impossible to, to destroy or be lost, but I beg to differ. I, th I think our civilization is very weak. I think it's very fragile. Uh, the, the millions, countless, hundreds of millions of people, billions of people, in the world today actually have no idea as individuals how to survive. Uh, we all depend on this complex network of yeah. skills and abilities that society, mm. that society creates. Uh, we are psychologically adapted to uh, stability, to the feeling that we're here for the long haul. And a sudden cataclysmic event, uh, whether it one that we bring upon ourselves with a global nuclear war, for example, which is perfectly possible, uh, or whether it's the result of a cosmic impact, an asteroid or a comet hitting the earth, or whether it's the result of some sort of horrific pandemic, uh, the ingredients are there to bring our civilization down, uh, to end our civilization. And we are psychologically fragile, and I do not think that we would survive the kind of cataclysm that occurred during the Younger Dryas. I think our civilization would be gone, and it would be the, the people who would survive would be the hunter-gatherers who still mm. exist in the world today, whether in the Amazon rainforest 
whether in the Namibian deserts, these are people who are in the business of survival. They are the ones who would survive. And that's precisely what I'm suggesting happened at the end of the Ice Age, that there were hunter-gatherers coexisting in the world with a more advanced type of civilization. The more advanced civilization went down, there were survivors, and smartly they took refuge amongst hunter-gatherers and shared with them some of their knowledge, just as the hunter-gatherers shared their knowledge with the survivors of the lost civilization. It's all a hypothesis, of course. Yeah. Not a fact. I'm not. I'm not claiming this is a fact. I'm. I'm putting this forward as a working hypothesis. Yes. How can? How else can we imagine that ancient civilization, that advanced age ancient? Because of course they weren't carrying cell phones around, right? But, but in what sense they were advanced that we can? And I know we need to imagine. And and I want to talk about imagination too, because it seems like we need to ask forgiveness to imagine. And and imagination is one of the main p paths to 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 knowledge one may say right so how how do you imagine them or what what evidences or 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 speculations can you share about how they, how they look like i first became i first became interested in the possibility of a lost civilization after reading a most extraordinary book that was published in the 1960s called hamlet's mill and that book was written by a professor of the history of science at the massachusetts institute of technology giorgio de santigliana And it was co-authored by Hertha von Deschen, who was professor of the history of science at the University of Frankfurt. Uh, and what they demonstrated in that book at enormous length, I mean, really, the, the evidence base is very, very, very solid, is extremely ancient knowledge of a phenomenon called the precession of the equinoxes. Mm -hmm. And the precession of the equinoxes is actually a result of a wobble on the axis of the Earth. Uh, and because the Earth is the viewing platform from which we observe the stars and the sun and the cosmos that surrounds us, changes in its orientation, change the positions and the rising times of particular stars and, and, and the constellations against the background of which the sun rises on the spring equinox. And that's why we have this notion of, um, we, we, we live in the age of Pisces. What does that mean? It means that at dawn on the spring equinox, 21st of March in the Northern hemisphere, the sun rises against the background of the constellation of Pisces. And everybody's heard the song, we live in the dawning of the age of Aquarius. That's because within the next 150 years, the sun will have completed its journey through the constellation of Pisces and will enter the constellation of Aquarius on the equinox. Uh, so that it will be the age of Aquarius. Back at the time of the early Christians, that's when the constellation of Pisces first began to house the sun. It's not an accident that the early Christians used the fish as their symbol. Before that, it was the constellation of Aries. Go to ancient Egypt, you will find Ram symbolism predominant at that time. Go back earlier, it's the age of Taurus. Eventually, you get back to the age of Leo around 12,000 years ago, uh, at which time at dawn on the spring equinox, the lion-bodied great sphinx would have gazed exactly at its celestial counterpart, the constellation of Leo uh, housing the sun on the spring equinox. This phenomenon takes place at the rate of one degree every 72 years. It takes 25,920 years to complete a, a whole cycle. Um, if you imagine the North Pole of the Earth extended into space, at the moment, our pole star is Polaris. That's because the extended North Pole of the Earth is pointing most directly, not exactly at, but very closely at Polaris. But it will not always point at Polaris, and it has not always pointed at Polaris. There was a time when Thuban in the constellation of Draco was the pole star. Because of that wobble on the axis of the Earth that is causing the pole to make a great circle in the skies, and at the same time it's having these effects on the zodiacal constellations at the equinox. To cut a long story short, Hamlet's Mill documents in extraordinary detail vast knowledge uh, of the precession of the equinox encoded in symbolism, and in numbers uh, all around the world. And those numbers are all multiples of the number 72. So I couldn't help noticing that the Great Pyramid also responds to that system. Uh, if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, which itself is a multiple of 72, it's 600 times 72, uh, you get the polar radius of the Earth. Uh, and if you measure the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by the same precessional number, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. 
This is thought to be coincidental by Egyptologists, but I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I think it's another example of that system of ideas that was first encapsulated by Santillana and von Deschent. Um, if the scale was different, I would be less impressed. But here we have a monument that is aligned to within three sixtieths of a single degree of true north, despite the fact that it has a 13 acre footprint, that it weighs 6 million tons, that it's 481 feet high, they managed to align it within 3 sixtieths of a single deg degree of true north. That tells us that it's connected to the earth, to a key place on the earth, and then its scale, its size, uses precession of the equinoxes, unfolding at the rate of one degree every 72 years to give a scale. If it was one to 57,420, I wouldn't be impressed. But because it's one to 43,200, I'm very impressed indeed. That tells us that they're giving us the dimensions of the earth on a scale defined by the earth itself, by mm -hmm. a key motion of the earth, which is the precession of its axis. Mm -hmm. So it was this knowledge of the cosmos, this knowledge of the key motions of the earth expressed in ancient mythology, going back to the, 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 the Rig Veda, going back before that, going back to remotest times where we cannot even begin to put a date on them that first intrigued me about the possibility of a lost civilization. And Santillana and von Deschen themselves uh, emphasize that this knowledge comes down to us from what they call some almost unbelievable ancestor civilization, uh, which has yet to be discovered. Uh, and that's really what set me on this, on this track, that we have, a, we have a civilization that had invested hundreds of years in making very detailed observations of the heavens, scientific observations, and then had expressed those observations in symbolism and in numbers and had passed them down to the future. Uh, this isn't building motor cars. It's not sending rockets to the moon. Uh, it's not doing the kind of hardware stuff that we do, but it's scientific software that we're looking at in this ancient system of ideas. Uh, and I believe that we're, we are likely to be looking at a civilization that regarded its place in the cosmos as sacred, that regarded the cosmos itself as sacred and that set about to understand the cosmos and the way that it works in a, in a level and to a depth that archaeologist does not normally attribute to hunter-gatherer civilizations of the Ice Age. Yes, that's fascinating. So do, do you think these were offerings to the gods or, I mean, all that knowledge expressed through those monuments, which of course were built later, right? You, you would say, but because they're really hard to find. They can, yeah. they, can be built, they can be built later or they can be built then. It doesn't, it mm. doesn't matter. It's the idea that continues down, that continues down through history. No, I think that, I think the language of astronomy was being used deliberately because it's a universal language. Uh, as I mentioned, the Indus Valley civilization did leave us a script, but we can't read their script. The script is useless to us in that sense. There's no Rosetta Stone that enables us to decode the script of the Indus Valley civilization. So there may be multiple documents existing in that script, but we simply can't read them. If you want to pass information down to the future to say, we were here and we knew this, then you need to do it in a language that a future civilization can understand. And the language of astronomy is one of those languages that, that, that can be decoded by any civilization which has spent the time to study the heavens closely. Mm. Uh, so I, I think that, that, that what we have here is a message that was passed down to us saying, don't ignore us, don't forget about us, don't imagine that we were simply primitive savages. We understood the universe, we understood the solar system, we understood the stars, we understood the motions of the Earth. Now, a strange thought came to mind as you were saying this, because we were talking about this sense of vulnerability at the species level. Now, what can we build? To, what, what could survive that we've built today if, if a cataclysm? I, I would suppose nothing at all. Is there something we've built that would survive if we went through? Would they know if, if history repeated itself, uh, itself and there was another Graham Hancock like thousands of years in the future, could they have some clue that we were here? A lot of archaeologists say, you know, Hancock must be wrong because we haven't found the trash of the lost civilization. Uh, that seems to me a very trivial uh, objection. Um, the, the earth went through such a massive cataclysm uh, the best lands on earth are the lands that were flooded 
at the end of the last ice age. The intertidal zone at depths of about five meters is a high energy zone where anything in it is going to be utterly destroyed and smashed to pieces. Um, the, 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 uh, the issue of the, of the trash of our civilization and how much of it would survive a global cataclysm and how much of it would still be there to be found 10 or 20,000 years from now is actually a very dubious issue. I'm not sure how much would be found at all of our civilization, even the plastics would degrade. Wow, what a thought, total oblivion, right? Yeah. No trace. No, 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 no trace and no effort is being made to preserve such knowledge as we have accumulated yeah. or to yeah. send a message to future generations. And, and, and I really think it should be because, because human life is fragile. We can't count on everything just staying stable forever. As I mentioned earlier, we unfortunately have the capacity to destroy ourselves. Uh, yeah. a, a, a nuclear war amongst the competing male egos in the world today is perfectly possible. Uh, perish the thought, but it, but it is possible. We can destroy ourselves completely and utterly. Uh, and given the fragile nature of our civilization and our life on earth, it would be wise to create an archive that could be passed down to the future in the event that our civilization was utterly destroyed. Uh, to pass something that would survive that destruction and would be passed down to the future. It just happens that nobody is creating such a thing at the moment. There did exist mm -hmm. such a thing in the past. It was called the Library of Alexandria. Uh, but the, a library is a very fragile thing in itself. We would not mm -hmm. be wise to create libraries of documents. There were thousands of years of documents in the Library of Alexandria collected from temple archives all over, all over Egypt and all over, all over the known world, all gone all yeah. completely gone so what we what is needed is an archive that will prevail that will last down the ages and a great deal of human intelligence needs to be applied to this problem because it's not only the creation of a structure or an edifice if that's what we're looking at which will survive any kind of cataclysm but it's also the contents of that archive we have to make sure that the contents can be deciphered 10,000 or 20,000 years into the future by, by a culture that has no knowledge whatsoever of our language. And that's why I think the use of astronomical language is particularly interesting. An example I often give, by the way, is the Hoover Dam um, in the United States. Uh, it so happened that Oscar Hansen, the, the, the architect who was involved in creating a star map in the Hoover Dam, there is, a, there is a large star map in the Hoover Dam. It actually freezes the skies above the Hoover Dam at the date that the Hoover Dam was completed. And that was done specifically so that a future civilization would be able to work out when the Hoover Dam was created. Well, I couldn't care less about the Hoover Dam, uh, but I do care about the preservation of knowledge and a great deal of thought needs to be put into this. And it's not being put into it at the moment. We are capable of spending trillions of dollars on weapons of mass destruction to destroy one another, to wipe out the human species entirely, but we're not investing anything in preserving and protecting our knowledge for the future in the event that another cataclysm occurs. Yes. And I get it, you know, nobody wants to think about cataclysms that much. It's, a, it's an unpleasant subject to think about, and I don't think we should dwell on it that much, but it should be part of our consideration. Well, if there's something more scary than dying is to think that you'll be forgotten. So we're talking about this from a personal to a species level, yeah. right? And, and I'm not a great fan of trans, the transhumanist agenda. And, and I don't think large language models are what we're talking about here, right? This is no. another route to the future. I, I don't think so. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me wrap up with a couple of themes. I'm not sure they're even questions. I wanted to, to talk a bit more about history and stories and storytelling. And this, I don't know if somebody has coined it, but I was thinking of, of his storytelling because in a way we need not only needs, we need to tell histories and stories about what happened, which maybe then can be framed more in the shape of theories, right? And, and to just to underscore the importance of stories and scientific imagination. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a story that everybody's familiar with and that every archaeologist rolls his or her eyes at, and that's the story of Atlantis. 
um, that, uh, that, that, that story is uh, sneered at and uh, dismissed by archaeologists. But it's interesting when you look at the story as it's told in Plato's dialogues, the Timaeus and the Critias, um, how he describes a once great and advanced civilization, which was dedicated to the nurture of spirit, which was generous and kind, but, mm -hmm. which, but which entered into a phase of corruption, that darkness entered in, that they became domineering, that they became arrogant, that they began to impose their will on other peoples around the world and to make war on other peoples around the world. And in a ringing phrase that they ceased to wear their prosperity with moderation. Mm. And the conclusion of that is that the universe struck them down for the, for the, for the sin of hubris, of self-pride, of being too pride, too arrogant, too sure of themselves. And, and in many ways, we tick all the boxes of the next lost civilization if, if it's looked at in mythological terms. We also suffer from intense hubris and arrogance. We also are imposing our power and our will uh, all around the world. We also have become excessively materialistic and have forgotten the nurture of spirit. Uh, in, in many ways, the, the, the message from the past is take care. You're in a difficult time. Uh, you need to grow up as a species if you're going to get through this next time. Um, yes, yes. So we haven't discussed concretely any of your books. We've talked about the Netflix series, Ancient Apocalypse. I want to finish by going back to 10 years ago. When... Right, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop you again there. I would, I would humbly request anyone who is feeling very negative and critical about my TV series, have a look at the books that lie behind it. I've spent 30 years writing a series of really rather enormous books, sometimes five or six or even 700 pages long, in some cases with 2000 footnotes. It's here that my case is, is thoroughly documented in detail. And it disappoints me uh, how little attention archeologists pay to the books while being willing to insult me in the worst possible ways, simply based on preconceptions about what I'm writing about rather than actually looking about what I'm writing about. Graham, so give us three titles. I know it's maybe a stupid question, but which would be the three books that you would want archaeologists and, and lay people like me to, uh, to, to start from? Definitely the three most recent of my books right. on the possibility of a lost civilization. And they are America Before, published in 2019, Magicians of the Gods, published in 2015, uh, and Underworld, published in 2002. Underworld is a formidable read, I have to admit, uh, but it was based on seven years of scuba diving all around the world where I found many man-made structures underwater directed to them by local divers and local fishermen uh, in areas where we knew that there had been very significant sea level rise at the, at, at the end of the last ice age. So, so I would say these, these three books are the most thoroughly documented and gradually as the, as the years have gone by, when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, which is probably my best known book in 1995, and I would urge viewers to have a look at Fingerprints of the Gods as well, um, I wasn't armoring my arguments against the hostility and uh, negative ad hominem attacks that archeologists would direct against my arguments. Mm -hmm. Those attacks began with Fingerprints of the Gods. And subsequently I began to be much more careful in documenting my evidence and, and in bulletproofing my arguments against these uh, rather, rather irrelevant attacks on me as a person instead of on the body of work. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you something. I, don't, I, I hope it's not indiscreet. How do you fund this research? This is not cheap, I suppose. And no, you, you're not in the circuit of government grants and so on. How do you I'm do not, it? Well, the first, the first book, uh, Fingerprints, of, Fingerprints of the Gods, the first book that investigates the lost civilization hypothesis, that was funded entirely on borrowed money, on uh, remortgaging my house three times, on maxing out every single credit card I have. I was, in, uh, I, I, I was in a very dangerous situation financially, but I put everything I had and everything I could borrow uh, into researching that book and doing the necessary travels because I am a, a boots on the ground researcher. I, I think it's important if I'm going to write about a place that I actually go there and spend, and spend time there. And yes, that does cost money. 
uh, with Fingerprints of the Gods, that was entirely borrowed money. Uh, luckily for me, Fingerprints of the Gods was a global bestseller. Um, it, it even sold 2 million copies in hardback in Japan. Uh, this, this then, first of all, got me out of debt, and secondly, began to provide me with the funding to do further research. And that further research has borne fruit in, in all of my subsequent books. So subsequently, fundamentally, I have to thank my readers uh, for funding my research. Mm -hmm. if it, 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 it's a cooperative venture between me and my readers. My readers empower me to get out there and do the research and do the detailed research that needs to be done in order to make a coherent case against a very established narrative, which is the narrative of archaeology. Yeah, that's being an amateur in capital letters, I suppose. Yeah. Yes. Okay, last one. Ten years ago, I was saying you had your TED Talk banned, yeah. and it was called, if I recall correctly, the War on Consciousness, wasn't Correct. it? That's right, yeah. Okay, now ten years back here, it seems like there's been a renaissance of psychedelic yeah. research, consciousness in its, in, in its heyday. Well, what do you think has happened? And it's a double question, sorry. And could that happen also for archaeology and the study of the past? I want to, because you were a pioneer there also in denouncing and proclaiming, well, we, we, should, we should be able to explore your own, to explore our yeah. own minds, right? So, so how do you compare those two? I feel I feel very strongly that the the result the, the the right of adults to sovereignty over their own consciousness while doing no harm to others should be regarded as a fundamental human right, and that all laws which seek to imprison us and ruin our lives uh, because we uh, explore the effects on our consciousness of of substances that are deemed to be illegal those laws are just plain wrong. They're an abuse of human rights. Uh, the key issue is doing no harm to others. But we already have laws that deal with individuals who do harm to others. We do not need laws that seek to patrol our consciousness and tell us what we may experience and what we may think while doing no harm to, to others. The main reason that that TED talk got banned, and it was the main reason that Rupert Sheldrake's talk at the same event got banned, uh, was because I considered a taboo subject, which is that consciousness may not be local to the brain. Certainly the brain is involved in consciousness in some way, it correlates with consciousness, but does it make consciousness? Does it manufacture consciousness? Or is consciousness in some way transmuted through the brain uh, into, into this physical reality? Those matters are not settled yet, but in mainstream science with its very materialist bias, uh, doesn't like the idea that consciousness may not be local to the brain. And that's why things like telepathy are sneered upon by mainstream science. And that's why Rupert Sheldrake's work documenting telepathy in a, in a highly scientific way is so important. Uh, you know, that, that uh, we, need to, we need to rid ourselves of these fixed and rigid paradigms. And we need to open up to extraordinary possibilities, which today may seem extraordinary, but tomorrow may seem completely normal. We've mm -hmm. seen the normalization of psychedelics in the past uh, decade, uh, very, very substantially so. Uh, it's still in process, it's still beginning, it's not there yet, uh, but, but psychedelics are no longer demonized in the way that they used to be. Uh, and indeed they are recognized for their therapeutic uh, effects. And this is the first step of a longer process because fundamentally psychedelics are incredible tools for exploring the deep, mysteries of consciousness. Uh, and this is the next thing that we as a species need to do. We need to understand what this miracle that we call consciousness is. And if we try to understand it without using psychedelics, uh, we're going to be crippled in that venture from the outset. Psychedelics are a very important tool. And fortunately, the scientific community is beginning to catch up to this. And that's a result of new evidence that has come in. Uh, and often that evidence was very difficult to gather because it went against the scientific mainstream at the time. I think the same will be true with archeology. span I think as more and more new evidence comes in that cannot be explained by the existing paradigm, we're going to come to a situation where the existing paradigm is more and more closely questioned. And that's what I've been doing for the last 30 years is I've been questioning the existing paradigm. And little by little over the years, new evidence has begun to come out which can't be explained by the existing paradigm. Just 20 years ago, even less, 
it was regarded as a definite fact that there could be no megalithic architecture without settled agricultural communities generating surpluses to allow people to develop expertise in architecture or engineering or astronomy to, to apply it in those, in those megaliths. And that, that it was thought that the oldest was perhaps Gigantia on the island of Malta, about 6,000 years old. And then lo and behold, Gobekli Tepe in Turkey was discovered, a huge megalithic site, 11,600 years old. Um, and that's really very, archeologists are doing their best to fit it into the existing paradigm. Uh, but, but most people who look at this from the point of view of common sense say it doesn't really fit into the existing paradigm and it should raise questions over the paradigm. Well, it's going to take more Gobekli Tepes, more discoveries yes. like that before the fixed and rigid paradigm of our past that archaeology purveys, before that paradigm is overthrown. But I think in due course it will be. Yes, indeed, piling up these anomalies. Well, so if one taboo wasn't enough, so here you've been pioneering our understanding of the past and also of consciousness. And, and I was gonna, well, I, I was gonna thank you and, and wish you, but not recognition, because you don't, I don't think you need that, but at least to be treated with justice so that you can continue your work with with peace at least. And so yes. thank you so much. The, the, only thing I, the only thing I would ask of archeology, span by all means, attack my work. Uh, that's an important thing to do. But I, I, I do wish they would stop with the ad hominem attacks. Uh, with with the attempts to portray me as somebody that I'm not, with the with the attempt to, as as your archaeologist contact told you, to get people to stay away from me. Yeah. This is not a healthy approach to somebody who's offering an alternative point of view. At the very least, it should be treated with um, with a modicum of interest rather than uh, than simply dismissed and not dismissed on basis of evidence, but dismissed on the basis of ad hominem attacks. Yes. I'm glad I didn't follow that advice. Uh, thank you, Graham. And let's open it up to the audience because I'm yeah, sure they'll sure. have comments or questions. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, both. And thank you, Graham, for bringing forward your uh, perspective. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the raise your hand function uh, under reactions at the bottom of your screen and uh, I'll invite you in. Uh, first, let's go with, uh, with Paul. Paul. I don't hear you, Paul. I think your microphone is muted. Found it. Got it. Thanks, Graham. Um, I hope this isn't off topic, but in the podcast you mentioned, uh, there's a new translation coming out of the Edfu Temple's, uh, one of the walls there by a German um, academic. Do you have any more information on when and- uh, it's, already, it's already out. The, the, the Edfu texts have been completely translated into German. Um, so um, uh, Dieter Kurth uh, is the head of the institute there, um, and uh, that that translation already exists. Uh, it would be it would be more generally available if it were also translated into English, uh, at, at, at the very least. Uh, but at, at present, it's in German, and that's very useful. That's okay. Um, because, because the German the German translation follows an earlier partial translation of the Edfu texts done by. Uh, Eve Elizabeth Raymond back in the 1960s. Um, and and the, the new translation confirms the key point, points in Raymond's earlier text. Do you have an exact title um, that point me to the, I think it might be a multi-volume uh, work that it you're is, referring to. It is a, it is a multi-volume I'm interested work. in the builders. So I think what you call the builders text. They, but they're called the Edfu building texts. Um, and it's very curious. They're, they're written on the walls of the Temple of Ed. The Temple of Edfu is actually a relatively recent uh, ancient Egyptian monument. It belongs to the Ptolemaic period. Uh, dates, it dates back around about 300 BC or thereabouts, perhaps even a little less. Um, but the language that's used on the walls of the Edfu oh. Temple is Middle Egyptian, dating back to 2000 BC. Um, and the, the Edfu texts themselves state that they draw upon much older archives uh, that belonged uh, to, the, to the temple. If you do a little bit of Google searching, you'll find the title in German. I don't remember it off the top of my head. Yeah. I, don't read, I don't read German, but fortunately I have a colleague who does. Uh, and he and I have been working uh, together on this. Uh, I'm, um, I'm interested in the, the tale of, you know, the, the, it was from your book, maybe Fingerprints of the Gods, where they... Yeah you reference it and uh, there's 
some in some volume there's re references to this origin story or the uh, Atlantis maybe it's an Atlantis like story yeah uh, the Yetu texts speak of an island which they call the homeland of the primeval ones they speak of its destruction in a cosmic cataclysm described symbolically as a serpent shooting down out of the sky and splitting the island and then the island is flooded and submerged there are survivors they travel to many different lands, one of them being Egypt, and there they build primeval mounds, which are to be the foundations of all future temples and pyramids to be built in that land. And it, I read it as an attempt to reboot civilization, to, to, start, to start again, not to, not, not to start from scratch, but to start again. Um, and, and the Edfu texts themselves bear comparison and this, of course, annoys archaeologists enormously uh, with Plato's uh, story of Atlantis and of an island that was home to an advanced civilization that was flooded and, uh, and, and destroyed in a, in a global cataclysm. Um, and um, it's interesting that, that the um, source for the Plato's narrative is Solon's visit to Egypt in 600 BC. He visits a temple Temple of Neith at Sais in the Delta. Uh, and there he's told the story of a place that he calls Atlantis. The Atlantis is not an ancient Egyptian word, but it's a word that, that, was, that, that, so, that was passed down from Solon's time to, to Plato's time, uh, 11,600 years ago. And those, those priests at the Temple of Neith at Sais in the Delta, when Solon talked to them, and they, des they describe the contents of the texts on the walls of their temple. Um, he, he asked them, when was Atlantis flooded? And they said very matter-of-factly, oh, 9,000 years ago. Well, that's 9,600 BC. That's a date we can put into, into our calendar. Uh, and uh, 9,600 BC is 11,600 years ago, give or take 20 years. And 11,600 years ago is indeed the end of the Younger Dryas meltwater pulse 1b and a cataclysmic rise in sea level. At Edfu, where the texts are written in Middle Egyptian, dating back to roughly 2000 BC, the same statement occurs, but there they say it happened 7,000 years ago. It's the same date that is given in Plato. So because it's 7,000 years before 2000 BC, in other words, 9,000 plus BC. Uh, so, so I think that I think that the Edfu building texts have a great deal to reveal to us. I'm very glad that they've been translated into German, and I only hope that they'll be translated into English so that I can read them myself without having to work with a, with, with a colleague. But I'm very lucky to have a colleague who is A, deeply experienced in ancient Egypt, and, and B, is fluent in German. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, for, uh, for coming in. Thank you. Thanks, Graham. Thanks. Yeah, I can see there's uh, quite a few questions uh, up. Um, so if, uh, if I can please ask to keep your questions a bit brief, just to make sure that we can uh, get to everyone. Um, next, let's go to Ines. Hello, Ines. Hi, hi, Graham. So glad to meet you. So happy. Nice Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, so, um, okay, you have touched so many topics that it's like kind of difficult to grasp and, yeah. and uh, you know, but first I wanted to know, were you denied access to Egypt or to the Egypt sites? No, um, we, we sought filming permission. We would like to have done an episode in oh. Egypt. And oh. when we sought that filming permission, we were informed that the filming permission would not be granted because I am presenting the series and that oh. I am no longer welcome in Egypt. Uh, oh. And this, this really goes back to the hostility of a particular Egyptologist who is very influential on the Egyptian government uh, mm -hmm. towards me. Uh, it, it, it was as simple as that. The, the best way to keep a critic out is to actually keep that critic out. And that's what they've done with me. So I simply can't go to Egypt anymore. Maybe I could go as a tourist, but to go there, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I don't fancy a year or two in an Egyptian jail either. Uh, I'm not sure whether I could go as a tourist or not, but what I do know is that I was officially banned from filming an episode in Egypt simply because I am who I am. 
Okay, and is Gobekli Tepe, the, the, the date they just said, oh, uh, 11,000 years, is that accepted by mainstream? They, they yes. accept that that's the date? Yes, absolutely. That's, a, that's dating produced by the German Archaeological Institute, and it's the dating of the, of the oldest so far excavated structure at Gobekli Tepe, which is Enclosure D. And Enclosure D, the, the rather unique thing about Gobekli Tepe, which makes it very different from many other archaeological sites, is that Gobekli Tepe was deliberately buried. It was created 11,600 years ago. It functioned for about a thousand years. During that thousand years, the local population who were hunter-gatherers all became agriculturalists. And then Gobekli Tepe was closed down. It was decommissioned and it was buried under hundreds, even thousands of tons of rubble. They poured rubble into all the enclosures, covered them up to the top of the huge megaliths, and then they built a hill over the top of it, all entirely man-made. That's what Gobekli Tepe means in the Turkish language. It means pot-bellied hill. And for the next 10,000 plus years, that's all it was thought to be. No other culture went in there and contaminated the site with later organic materials. It was a pure, pristine site that had been untouched for more than 10,000 years. And that's why we can be pretty confident about the dating that came from that site. In many sites, you can't be confident about carbon dating because the question is, is that piece of, carbon dating only dates organic material. So is that piece of organic material in a place where it could only have been put there when the megalith was put in place? Uh, very often it's not. Um, is it organic material that was introduced by a later culture? Very often it turns out to be that that is the case. But in Gobekli Tepe, there's no question of that because of the deliberate burial of the site. So yes, the date is firm and the date is, uh, is a mainstream archaeological date. So then that's completely uh, overwhelming for, for, for the whole narrative of the standard archaeology. I believe it is. I believe it is. But now, but now archaeologists are trying to say, oh, but there was a gradual build up to Gobekli Tepe and they cite yeah. various cultures such as the Natufian culture who built tiny stone walls like a dry stone wall in Wales. Um, and and uh, they say that this is evidence of evolution towards Gobekli Tepe. I, I don't see it as that. Okay. Yeah, I would just make my last comment would be uh, re regarding consciousness and psychedelics and, and that I have the feeling that now because psychedelics can, can induce these states of consciousness or of amplified consciousness, that they will say that this is all happening in the brain. You know, this is not playing in favor of of uh, non locality. It is playing in favor of this is all happening in the brain, and this is this is the proof of that. You know, so basically, what, of course, what all our all our experiences happen in the brain. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the, the question is, what is what is the brain? Uh, yeah. and, at, and at the moment, um, we cannot be clear that the brain makes consciousness. Uh, we can only say that consciousness is associated with the brain, but we can't say that the brain makes consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe the, the, the analogy I draw is that maybe the relationship of consciousness to the brain is more like the relationship between a television signal and a television set. Uh, you can destroy the television set, but the signal still stays there. Whereas the, the materialist view would say, when you destroy the brain, that's the end of everything and there is no signal left. So, you know, maybe consciousness is manifesting through the brain and that yeah. would fit in with many ancient traditions that we are in some sense avatars. Uh, physical yeah. bodies allow us to maneuver in this physical realm and to learn and develop and to grow in this physical realm. I don't think we should close our minds to these possibilities. Any honest scientist will admit they haven't solved the problem of consciousness yet. We yeah, don't understand what it is. It's not enough to say that it's a, just an, epi, an epiphenomenon of brain activity. You know, we need these big brains in order to function in the jungle of competition. And by accident, we got consciousness. Well, that may be true, but it's only a hypothesis. It's only a theory. And uh, the fact of the matter is science doesn't know what consciousness is. Yeah, I agree completely Thank with you. this because in fact, I work in a team that Nassim Haramein, maybe you've heard of him. I and, know uh, yeah, so yeah, so we, I'm part of this research team. And right. uh, yeah, so so yeah, completely agree with that. I'm just thinking that known locality will have to be proven more like in order for that to be accepted. Like, oh, yes. all, yeah, yeah. Known locality yeah. And, that, and that's where Rupert Sheldrake's work on, on yes. telepathy 
is of, yeah. is of great interest because if telepathy can occur, then, tele then, then consciousness is not local to the brain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Rahim. That this would be my question. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to invite um, Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Hi. Sorry, I wasn't expecting to jump the queue like that. Hello, Graham. Um, Hello. Uh, I've actually read Hamlet's Mill. Okay. Oh, and the book that took me on the way to that was this one, which you may know. Oh, which oh, I, that's an ex excellent book, The Secret of I, the Incas. Yes. I read after visiting Peru. But I've also dived at Yonaguni. Oh, well done. Which And got very drunk with the guy who discovered it, as you may well have done as well. But my, my, son, yes. my, um, my contribution is that there's, you wrote a book called Underworld. There's a book called Underland. Yeah, by Robert McFarlane, which I know Maureen has read. That may mean that uh, Eleanor has read as well. But there's a, a piece in here about how do you protect high level nuclear waste that has to be undisturbed for tens of thousands of years. Yeah. And the US Department of Energy convened a working group called the Human Interference Task Force to come up with a way that would work for times completely outside our post-industrial time scale. And the winner wasn't any material monument, it was myth, it was legend, it was narrative, it was a story that could be passed ver verbally down generations. Even as language evolved, the story would evolve. But Good that... stories keep on getting told generation after generation. Stories are great ways to preserve knowledge. Absolutely. But my point is that you, you should pull on something like that, because these are these are mega so-called rational people, yeah. you know, looking to the future. And I think it retrospectively endorses a lot of what you're saying. Good point. Thank you. I will yeah. take a look. I will take a look yeah. at that. Yeah. 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 OK, yeah. definitely. You. And those stories would uh, would serve as warnings to future humans. Uh, that these stockpiles of uh, extremely dangerous materials do exist. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you, Thank you uh, Andrew. Um, next, let's um, Jacqueline. Hi. Hello. Oh, your sound is muted. Sorry about that. Oh, there we go. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I know you've done quite a lot of research on the me megalithic structures. And I was wondering um, if you were familiar with some of uh, Anthony Peratt's uh, research in uh, plasma physics. Um, he found similarities between some of the ancient petroglyphs and monolithic structures. And there um, there's similarities with um, plasmoid discharges or yeah. uh, that was, and, Wondering I'm how that fits into I'm your not very familiar with Anthony Perrat's work, but I, I do know that um, solar activity is one of the other explanations that's given for the Younger Dryas cataclysm, mm -hmm. uh, which which unfolded between twelve thousand eight hundred and eleven thousand six hundred years ago. I think nobody now is disputing that that period of time, that one thousand two hundred years uh, between twelve thousand eight hundred and eleven thousand six hundred years ago, was a cataclysmic time, uh, but there are disputes about what caused it. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally prefer the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Uh, I think the evidence in the Younger Dryas boundary layer all around the world speaks eloquently uh, that the Earth was bombarded by multiple fragments of a disintegrating comet. In many cases, those fragments didn't even hit the ground. They blew up in the air, like the airburst that occurred over Tunguska in Siberia in, on the 30th of June, 1908. Uh, that devastated 2000 square miles of trees in the Siberian forest. Fortunately, it was an uninhabited area. We're looking at hundreds of events like that that took place at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. But another explanation that's given is, uh, is solar activity uh, and, and plasma discharges and the suggestion that these are documented in rock art uh, all around the world. Uh, I'm, I'm open to that. I happen to prefer the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, 
I think it supports the evidence better. It could be a combination of both. It could be that you're dealing with impacts 12,800 years ago and a sudden surge of solar activity 11,600 years ago, which puts the world out of a deep freeze and into a rapid warming phase. Uh, all we can be sure of is there was a cataclysm. The exact agency that caused that cataclysm is still a matter of opinion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you uh, Jacqueline. Uh, next, um, I can see Alain has a question. Hello. Thank you. Yes, thank you for a very remarkable um, expose. I was wondering, you didn't mention climate change or uh, acidification of the oceans, et cetera, as a cause of probable cataclysm now yeah. in the next 20, 30 years. Is there any sign that Atlantis, which uh, uh, you, you say we could check probably pretty much about our civilization, what could be checked about Atlantis, did they cause, did, could they have caused themselves their own decline by the kind of activities they had, as every, we are doing now? Every myth and tradition that I know of that speaks of the destruction of a former civilization in the remote past implicates that civilization in its own destruction. Mm. Uh, whether it caused that directly, as we are capable of doing, uh, yes. through the mess that we're making of planet Earth, through nuclear war, for example, uh, or whether it simply didn't have its eye on the ball, whether it was focusing on other things when it should have been focusing on its own survival more, more carefully is not, is not so clear. Um, mm -hmm. But that's true of the Atlantis myth as it's true of all other flood myths, that, uh, that our ancestors fell out of harmony with the universe uh, and that the universe responded by slapping them down. Uh, and, and that's why I would say our civilization does tick all the boxes, all the mythological boxes for the next lost civilization. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Alain. Um, let's go to Clark next. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, you can. Good. Uh, well, anyway, um, um, Thank you very much for this, Alex, and for the organization for making this available, especially at no cost. Anyway, I, I'm uh, new to you, Graham, and I'm just delighted with this. I'll keep this really short. So I live in the Pacific Northwest, born and raised, and uh, we had the Missoula flood around the time of uh, your work. Indeed so. And... Uh, so um, I also do a lot of boating. And when you go up and down the Columbia Gorge, you see uh, uh, terracing mm -hmm. uh, on the hillsides. And so that's, it's pretty clear that that's evidence of multiple floods. Yeah. So there were multiple ice ages before the one that you're speaking of. Ha have you, do those multiple ice ages have any relevance to you or that was just too long ago to to speak to the issue of mankind. I'm particularly focused on the end of the last ice age and the period around 12,800 years ago. The Missoula floods themselves are uh, an issue that requires further consideration. Um, it's said, the, 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 the general argument is that those glacial lakes uh, had ice dams and that the ice dams periodically would burst and would unleash flooding on the landscape. Um, and, and that this happened many times. It's been suggested that there were as many as 80 of the Missoula floods in the period between roughly 14,000 and, and 12,000 years ago. Um, I don't know if you've been to the Channel Scablands, uh, not far, not that far from the Pacific Northwest, um, but this is a landscape that is, that is heavily marked uh, by evidence of cataclysmic flooding. The, the whole of the American Northwest actually is intriguing in this area. And I think more work needs to be done before we establish exactly what was going on here. Something caused those ice dams to burst cataclysmically. Uh, and the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis suggests that it was the result of comet fragments impacting with the North American ice cap and releasing huge amounts of meltwater, which then spilled into the glacial lakes and caused those lakes to overflow their, their boundaries. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was uh, that was what I was curious about. Great. Good, good to talk to you. 
Thank you very much, um, Clark. Um, as we have only five minutes left, um, I'd just like to go uh, back to you, Alex and Graham, to see if you have any uh, final thoughts on, um, on this past session. I'll just say that I think what we're trying to do here is inquiry. And we're not trying to be right or wrong. And I'm delight delighted that we've heard a way for brave, honest, and also vulnerable inquiry. Um, I'm very, very grateful for everyone who agrees to talk to me, and particular to you, Graham, for, for sharing all of that with us and for the way you're doing it. And I really wish you, I really wish you all the best with your inquiry. We 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 need it. And the future human needs this kind of inquiry. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you for for the discussion. I've I've very much enjoyed it. I think it was uh, I think it was helpful. And you're right. This is about inquiry, open-minded inquiry into the past, not um, not fantastical, whimsical inquiry into the past, but detailed boots on the ground investigation of the past. And that's what I've devoted my life to for more than thirty years. Uh, and, and that's why I find it so offensive that archaeologists uh, just dismiss me as, 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 as a pseudo this or a, or a pseudo that. Uh, I, I don't think I'm a pseudo anything. I'm just, uh, I, I, I'm just a researcher and investigator fascinated by the past uh, and willing to offer a contrary point of view. I wish you well. I wish you strength and, and health and, and fortune. Yes, Thank I do. You. Thank you very much indeed. Good to oh. talk to you. Oh, great. Thank you so much, uh, both. Thank you so much, Graham, for uh, joining us today. And of course, thank you, Alex, for uh, continuing holding uh, the space and uh, these conversations with uh, such guests. Um, before we all go, uh, I'd just like to remind you all of uh, tomorrow's session, uh, where we have invited Merlin Sheldrake uh, to be in conversation with Alex again. Part of this series, it will be at the same time, it will be for free, it will just be a different link. Um, they will be discussing together, well, orbiting around the conversation of the entangled lives of fauna, flora, and fungi. Uh, so I hope to see you all then. Um, apologies to those who didn't um, get to ask their questions, but I'm sure we will have the opportunity in the future to discuss these topics further. Um, and thank you again, everyone. Um, we'll see you again soon here thank at you. the Play Center. Bye-bye. Good to talk to you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.